So welcome to the May Unite Wanna Fly trip planning, packing and organization uh, uh, monthly virtual meeting. And I am very blessed to have both um, Angelica and also Erica Nelson that are gonna be here to co-host and really talk about how they organize and how they pack and how we can learn from them as well. So first, Angelica, if you want to introduce yourself, and uh, and then I'll um, go into it with Erica, and then we'll get started. Hi, everyone. I'm Angelica Talon, and I am so excited to meet you all. Thank you all for joining us tonight. I am the DEI liaison for United on the Fly. I'm also um, a lifestyle and travel blogger located in Washington, D.C., and I get uh, to go on a lot of sponsor trips. I get to review hotels and restaurants and um, learn a lot about the travel industry. And one of the things that I learned is to use packing cues. So I can't wait to share all of my tips with you all. Awesome. Um, and then Erica, do you wanna introduce yourself? Sure, hey everyone. Uh, my name is Erica Nelson. My pronouns are she and her. Um, my, I have a podcast called the Awkward Angler Podcast. I'm also a Brown Folks Fishing Ambassador. Um, and I'm also the co-founder of Real Consulting, which stands for Reconcile, Evolve, Advance, and Lead. Um, and we co-created the Angling for All Pledge. Awesome. I'm so, thank you guys again so much. I can't say thank you enough for being here and helping out. Um, cool packing. So Angelica, what I'll do in both Angelica and Erica, well, um, I'll kind of get your cues and then I can just scroll through each um, photo if, you know, while you guys are talking. So um, we'll start with, here we go. All right, Miss Angelica. Here we go, packing cues. <laughs> <laughs> so I love to try to be as minimalistic as possible. Uh, a typical trip for me is normally three days, but I sometimes travel between seven and 10 days. And I also love to use a carry-on bag when I'm traveling on an airplane so that I don't have to pay for luggage. So we'll talk a little bit about this baby in a little bit. And we can go to the next slide. Rolling the clothes. That's like my favorite uh, lesson that I've learned. If you guys heard a ding, I apologize. I thought I muted everything. I just sent the family out of the house and I, I'm all by myself, but on occasion, they like to see what mommy's doing. So sorry about that. <laughs> but basically one of the ways to roll your clothes is just to take a basic top and fold it as little as possible like this, like so. And I have been living by the number three. So I take three of every item I can with the exception of my caps and the exception of my undies and, um, and like sunglasses. And then you just like, can fit as much as you can. I have something already prepared for you all so you can see. Another packing cube. This particular one fits up to about 10 hats and I can get uh, about three to five waiting belts in here as well. And we can go to the next slide. <laughs> and I only pack two pieces of luggage no matter where I go. Oh my God, that is so adorable. <laughs> But um, basically I take uh, my carry on bag and a personal, gar uh, personal piece of luggage on the plane with me. And I also only carry two pieces when I'm going on a road trip, just to try to keep it as minimalistic and simple as possible. I don't like the, the bulkiness of it all. And I think that you guys could get, are you people, you humans, you folks, sorry, I am working on my pronouns. And it's a habit that I'm trying to break. So forgive me um, for you all to, um, to just minimize and take two bags on. I pack lightweight um, bags into the luggage, including my Sims taco bag. And I also have an Athleta bag that is waterproof that they give to you when you purchase anything from their store. We can go to the next slide. And so, yeah, some of the basic tips that I'm sharing tonight is just to limit your bulk and try to uh, get lightweight uh, luggage so that you don't have to pay for that extra 
poundage when you are flying on an airplane and also so that you actually have some extra cargo space when you're driving on your okay yeah so one of the things that i used to do is i used to use hard shell luggage and you guys again i'm saying you guys <laughs> you all might uh have heard of away bags or away luggage those are lightweight shell luggage that i still use but uh, time and time again, I would see that it was very heavy. And so I moved to a little bit more of a malleable uh, luggage. And my favorite is the Eddie Bauer Expedition. It comes in three sizes. The black one that you just saw here is the carry-on size. It's 21 liters. This is the medium size. And this is the one that I took to Pyramid Lake. And it had enough clothes and gear in it to last for about 12 days. and less is more. When you're out, it doesn't matter if you're staying at a hostel, a hotel, an Airbnb, um, or someone else's home, normally you have access to laundry. And so I typically try to avoid doing laundry, but if you pack minimalistically and something gets dirty or ruined, this is an opportunity for you to just simply use a couple of coins and refresh your laundry and you're good to go. This is my packing list because I have to keep everything in order. Or I will forget something. And do you think I uh, have everything on here? Or is there anything that we need to add? Is, anyone can chime in. I'll chime in. Uh, I was looking at your packing list and it's pretty much on par with what I bring as well. Um, and the non-perishable snacks is something that I'm curious on what you bring. I typically leave beef jerky in my car or like a packet of chicken or something just in case when I'm on a road trip. So what kind of non-perishable snacks do you bring? I really love the Vermont brand of the turkey jerky sticks and any type of meat sticks. But for those vegans and vegetarians, um, there are some pro bars that I really like that you can buy from Amazon and they have uh, sweet versions and savory. And those really sustain me. I, you know, for about three to four hours, I also try to carry a stainless steel water bottle um, for to, to stay hydrated and on occasion I'll bring a collapsible water um, and I, I should have brought it out and I fill it every single time I get to the airport I go straight to the room to the restroom and I fill it up with water and I'll do that when I like arrive at some place that I've road tripped as well. One thing I just also thought of that I keep is like a powder or a shake or something, because sometimes you get in late and there's nothing open, especially if you're driving through rural areas in, in COVID. So um, really having those like meal replacement stuff is something that I found um, handy to have just in case. The other, th sorry, my dog's barking, but um, I'll close my door. Um, the other thing I do is compression socks. like. I am a huge, I literally, every time I'm flying or long drives, and maybe it's because I'm a nurse and I am worried about DVTs, which are deep vein thrombosis, like a blood clot, um, but also my feet swell. And so, um, especially going from like a, a dry climate to a warm climate, I always wear, I sleep in compression socks. So that would be something that I would add on my list as well. And they're pretty inexpensive on, you know, you can get a pair of compression socks pretty, pretty cheaply, very inexpensively. So yeah, cool. There is a question in chat. Uh, someone asked, uh, do you check a bag or do you carry on only? I try to uh, carry on only because there's been so many times I can't even tell you that my flight has been canceled or, or and my luggage has gone on to another location and I haven't received it. But if uh, the trip is going to be a longer trip, seven to sometimes 14 days, I definitely wanna check it in because I want to be able to carry more. How do you take your rods and reels with you? You can carry, I carry them on or because I don't want anything to happen to them or I'll put them in, they actually fit in the, in the suitcase that I just showed you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, and we'll, and I'll be covering, whoops, oh my gosh, sorry. I'll be covering, I'm scrolling too much. Um, I'll be covering a, some of the different uh, ways of carrying them on an airplane too. So we'll cover that as well. Um, yeah, cool. 
I'm just looking any other questions. No. All right. Collapsible staff for hiking for hiking and waiting. I like that too. Um, cool. All right. Yeah. That, so <laughs> this is one of the best tips that I learned. And that is to like to put all of your heavy clothes on, like put it, put them on you. And that way you know, when you're going through, you still have to take off your sneakers or your uh, shoes here at, at DCA airport or the Reagan National Airport or Dulles or BWI. Those are the three airports that are native to the DC area. And I go there with like four or five layers of clothes on. And I think the a lot of the people that are in security know who I am. So they just start laughing. But <laughs> they're like, oh, is this another long trip? I'm like, yeah, it's like six or seven hours. But this is great too, because you're layering and sometimes people get cold on the airplanes. I'm a menopausal woman. So I get like really super hot and I like the opposite. So I, I just want to peel off everything. <laughs> I have on. So this is the best tip. If you want to bring a, a really like heavy pair of waiting boots and you don't want to pay that extra check-in fee, this is how I, I've worn them through the airport before. And I love to, I love to cart uh, road trip. That's my favorite way to get around. We we're from Ohio originally. And so we go home quite a bit and you can always control the temperature of your climate in your car. And a lot of us have the type of uh, vehicles where you can have uh, 65 degrees on one side of the car and 85 on the other. So we tend to really, uh, um, wear light clothing and dress the way that we want to feel when we're inside of our vehicle. Well, thank you guys. Thank you all for uh, having me here. And I hope that some of these tips were really great for you all. And if there's anything that you um, want to share with me or you have any other questions, you can reach me at angelicainthecity at gmail.com. And we'll be doing uh, the whole month of May will be all of the Tuesday tips will be um, included with Erica and Angelica's tips. So a lot of this, we'll have a bunch of writing on this and a blog post and a video and all that kind of stuff as well. So you'll, you'll be seeing more and more of this um, and it's another great opportunity to ask questions also. So, um, all right, let's talk about some car organization. And this is Erica, I love this video. So let's watch it really fast. <laughs> like perfect. All right. All right. So um, my job, I'm a consultant. So I travel around just to meet clients face to face. I know, right? We get to start meeting face to face more and more, which is nice. Um, and I just like to travel in general. I'm a fan of road trips. So if I can drive there, I'll definitely choose that option. So I'm in the car a lot. <laughs> and um, my last two jobs also were 60% travel, but I had to drive. So I've gotten used to um, you know, kind of, or I've been working on systems over and over of trying to figure out how am I going to stay organized and how, how can I fish along the way? So I typically, when I have a trip that I'm going to go on, I will map out and actually plan to stop along the way to fish wherever I'm going, even if it's a fishing trip. So I always kind of like to look for different opportunities and, and whatnot to, to, um, to stop and fish. So um, just kind of one thing to consider if that's something that you want to try is maybe, you know, um, road tripping, but also fishing along the way is just kind of a mindset. Um, I've noticed that today, I actually just got back from um, Boulder, which is a three hour drive. So I typically make about three hour drives into nine hour days. <laughs> and so um, just kind of that mi mindset of, am I gonna plan to stop and enjoy? Or are you one of those people that just wants to get there? <laughs> and so really just kind of, it's okay if you change your mind, but that's just one thing that I've noticed about myself is I'm, you know, I'm kind of hard on myself of, oh, I was planning to fish, but you know, I just wanted to get there. I just wanted to get there. So, um, and then also if you're traveling with anybody, um, checking in to see if that's what they want to do, or if they're also the type that just kind of wants to, you know, no stops. <laughs> so that's just kind of something to consider before you, before you get on the road. 
Um, so I kind of like to uh, uh, chunk this out into three different parts. So pre-trip, you know, on your trip and then post-trip. And so pre-trip is um, just kind of making sure that you're adding in that fishing time. Um, you know, if you're Googling at, you know, what's the time drive time that I'm going to have, but adding a couple hours um, per stop. So if I'm going to stop at a couple places, you know, do I need to wait her up when I get there? Do I need to set up my rig? Is there hiking time perhaps, um, you know, and then you're on the river time and then also the de-rigging and unwaitering and whatnot. So just kind of some little details to kind of consider and to think about um, and adding into your trip especially if you're meeting somebody um, at the end of your destination. So, um, and then I also like, I'm a big fan of lists as well. So <laughs> definitely, I'm a, I, I, you know, I have my packing list, I have my on the road list, you know, and everything else that I need. So just making a list for everything and what to do as well. Um, I also advise checking the weather. <laughs> I've been in some interesting situations, particularly today from, um, I drove from Denver to Carbondale today in Colorado and um, it snowed. Um, and then once I got over a certain mountain pass, it was nice and sunny. And um, then when I got home, it was raining and hailing. So just kind of making sure that if you're gonna stop in those places. So I had kind of had to pack for pretty much all seasons today. <laughs> um, and then I also, brought some things like emergency equipments, like, um, you know, the non-perishable foods and making sure that I have um, a water bottle and also extra water on hand just in case something happens. Um, and then I also, um, uh, if I'm going to take an extended trip and I'm camping, or if I just want to like bring some things to make or make food on the road, I will actually put those in the freezer. Um, so what can I freeze ahead of time? So water bottles, any lunch meat, um, any dinners that I'm trying to cook or whatnot. Um, and that just kind of goes right in my cooler um, when I'm packing. And then also making sure that, you know, this is kind of an easy one, but charging your batteries, <laughs> your phones and all the things, especially if you're camping, making sure that you get ahead of that. Um, and then also make sure that you check for fishing licenses, especially if you're traveling out of state. So where am I going to go? And we'll get to, I'll get to more of that um, in a little bit. Um, and then also just kind of going off of, um, this is already mentioned and I'm sure it'll be mentioned again, but the, uh, this is one thing that I like to kind of bring up. This is one, knowing your route and acknowledging the land. Um, I identify as an indigenous woman. My tribe is Navajo. Um, and one of the things that I like to know is, you know, whose water are fishing on? Whose water am I traveling on? Who are the ancestral, uh, you know, caretakers of this land? So that's one um, app um, I just kind of put in the link in the chat there that I like to use just to kind of have that, that reverence and kind of that mindset of, you know, I'm, I'm traveling on indigenous lands. And then I kind of want to look at um, how do I know what lands can and waters can I actually fish? So, you know, if you're so used to just staying in your area, but now you're going to travel to a new area, how do you know what's kind of what's legal, what's not legal? So I'm just going to go over really briefly, but I'm also going to put this really awesome resource um, into the chat as well. And this is just kind of going over four different land management management types. Um, so there's the National Park Service, also known as NPS. So that's pretty much all of our national parks. An example of that would be Yellowstone, you know. Um, and also going back to the licensing, if you're traveling in national park lands and you want to fish there, um, typically there's, uh, you know, definitely check in with the park office because you might need a park license in addition to a state license. So there you might need two different licenses. <laughs> and so uh, just making sure that you're getting ahead of that um, is, is really helpful. The other land management is the BLM, also known as the Bureau, Bureau of Land Management, also known as Public Lands. And that's pretty much considered desert lowlands, like um, lowlands um, type of sagebrush, foothill area type stuff. Um, I don't know if anyone's heard of, you know, public lands or our lands. So we can basically, those are definitely our lands. <laughs> and so you can camp anywhere, um, typically up to 14 days um, for free. So there's a lot of dispersed camping and stuff um, and sites and things that you can fish on as well um, in the BLM. There's also the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, that is more or less um, national hatcheries, fisheries. So that's also a resource that you can look at to look at different fisheries if you're looking to kind of hit up those spots. Um, and they also have really great information if you find an office as well um, on getting maps and whatnot um, in the local area that you're traveling to. The fourth, or excuse me, the third, um, or excuse me, well, the fourth land management is the U.S. Forest Service, um, and that's typically um, public lands in national forests and um, 
uh, and grasslands. So um, this is the resource that I'm putting in the chat. It's a great article um, on a Knowles blog, kind of going over all those different land managements. Um, there's also um, tribal lands as well. So tribal lands definitely um, are, are have sovereign lands that they manage themselves. So checking in to see if you're going to travel into any of those areas is really helpful um, that I found. And if you don't know, um, I'm just throwing in all these links here in the chat. <laughs> here is a map of the BIA, which stands for Bureau uh, uh, Bureau. Well, Bureau of Indian Affairs. Wow, my mind went blank there. And so that is tribal land management um, if you happen to be going through different lands. Um, Wyoming kind of sticks out in particular, especially if you're going from Jackson um, and heading, heading east, you'll hit um, the Wind River Reservation and different um, tribes along the way. So, and really great waters to fish as well and definitely worth the, the extra fishing license as well if you're traveling in that area. Um, if you're kind of not looking to be old school and looking at maps, um, there is a, an app called OnX, and I use the hunting app. It's about $100 a year, um, so I just kind of bit the bullet and, and bought it, which has been really helpful um, to kind of understand whose land am I on, not like, like today. <laughs> so um, it actually has landowners um, landowners' uh, names on the map as well. So you're able to see, is this BLM? Is this uh, Forest Service? Is this managed by the Wild Fish um, and Services Land? So that's just kind of another resource um, that I like to use as well. So that's kind of the planning part of your road trip. Um, and then I'll kind of talk about packing as well. So Angelica had, you know, um, make sure you have all your chargers. So I just kind of like to keep mine handy as well. I like to have a car charging station just to make sure that I'm staying charged. So there's converter boxes and stuff that you can have um, and they're pretty cheap. You can get them at Walmart as well. Um, also, I pack for the road hazards. Uh, my example today, you know, going through all four seasons. So making sure I have an ice scraper, <laughs> I have water, uh, non-perishable foods and, and whatnot, just in case um, I happen to get stuck. And then I also kind of plan uh, making sure that I'm packing um, and prepared for a day on the water. So sometimes um, you just want to pack, get in the car, then you get to your destination, that's it. And then, or if you want to stop, you're kind of digging through your luggage. So I kind of like to make sure that I'm setting my fishing stuff aside, um, like a sun shirt, um, et cetera, of a day on the water. I liked Angelica's slide and her tip of wear a light outfit in the car, because you can always adjust. So I always typically change into my fishing clothes and then back into my road trip clothes. <laughs> and so that's just kind of what I've learn to do along the way to stay comfortable. Um, and then also just kind of making sure that your um, fishing gear is accessible. Um, uh, so that way you're not packing your luggage on top of it and then you're kind of digging all over for it. So <laughs> making sure that um, it's on top, you're able to get it. Um, I also like to keep mine hidden. So if we look at the photo, I have um, been playing around with different boxes and there is that plastic box, which is um, hosting and hiding my um, my new bag. Um, I'm really excited about a new pack that I got um, to take on the water by Orvis. And so I don't feel comfortable um, sometimes just laying all this expensive gear out. <laughs> and so, especially if I'm traveling to places I just don't know. So um, this one has a lid and I can also access it in the front as well. And it's just stacked on top of another one identical to that. And that was about $6 from Walmart. Um, and I was really stoked about that because <laughs> um, if I get dirty and stuff in it. I can also just um, hose it out and let it dry um, after my trip as well. And then there's the box in the front and that is hosting my waders and my boots. And that's actually a wooden box that I found at Target and that was about $25. And um, I have lined it with an Ikea bag. I am a big fan of Ikea bags, anybody else? <laughs> So it's kind of like type tarp material. It's really heavy duty. Um, so um, that's really great to just kind of store it in there. Um, and then I also um, put my wet things in there. And then when I get home or to my destination, I'm able just to kind of um, take the bag um, and take it to the hotel room or wherever I'm staying and let it dry, dry out for the night. Um, so that's just kind of some um, storage areas that I kind of like to use. Um, there's my green water bottle um, that I like to keep filled. It's about five gallons. Um, really great um, for hand washing, for washing dishes, for um, you know extra water if you don't want to stop at a gas station. Um, so just really nice to kind of have um, in handy. 
Um, I also just keep a bag, um, which is behind the water bottle with just extra clothes. So like a puffy, a rain jacket, um, extra socks, you know, just kind of basic river stuff in case. Um, and, and I always kind of prepare if I fall into the water, <laughs> I'm able to kind of just have that extra layer on handy. That other little bag that's red and white in the front, um, that's actually a upcycled bag made out of um, a sailing material, so an old sail. And so it's kind of material, it's a little bit stronger than the Ikea bag. Um, I happen to just find that in a free pile. I'm, I'm also super cheap, by the way, so <laughs> I'm all for free piles that are on the side of the road. Um, but I actually have wet wading shoes um, and neoprene socks. So um, I don't like to stuff my wet stuff, um, you know, in the car when I'm done. So I just kind of like to keep those isolated and separate um, as well. So that's just kind of another idea. Um, I also bring my rod tube as well. Um, and I typically have a camp chair just for, um, you never know when you just want to chill on the side of the river <laughs> and watch hatches. So, um, and then my net as well. And then you'll see the bungee cord there. Um, somebody on Instagram asked, why do people have the X, like the two connected? Um, and honestly, the answer to that is um, it was the cheapest assorted packet because I didn't know if this was going to work or not. And so I just bought an assorted package of, of bungee cords. And I have a little um, holders on the side. Um, I've seen folks kind of also use the top if you have like the handlebar on the top of your car that will also attach it there. Um, and that's just for my rod reel to sit in. And then I um, guide my, my rod into the seat up front just for more stability. Um, and that's been kind of, that's been working really well for me lately um, is something that I've I've come to find. I'm open to other tips and advice and stuff. So I'm not um, ready to bite the bullet on a rod vault. Those are pretty pricey and I don't know if I how to mount it. So um, this is just kind of my quick fix um, for, for, um, for holding my rod. And the paint roller. Yes. So <laughs> I've had a lot of fun. So whenever I, you know, typically when I'm done fishing, I am in a wad, I'm, you know, my flies are just not working out for me. Um, and they're just a mess. Or if I just want to rig in my car, but I don't feel like digging anything out. Um, though I actually put my flies on that. Um, so I'll clip them and, and host my flies there. Or if I have a really great nymph setup, so I have a fly here and another, you know, um, couple um, feet of tippet, I'll hook it on there and then I'll roll it and then I'll hook the other one so that way I can reuse it um, in my next stop as well. Um, I've been playing around with that. I've also used um, a metal dish. I found like a metal dish in the automotive section at Walmart and so I kind of played with that um, because it was um, magnetic. Um, so that kind of hosted my flies um, as well. I also kind of played with going into the craft section and getting a magnet, like a magnet strip, foam squares, um, or a Velcro strip as well. So definitely MacGyver trick. <laughs> I'm really proud of that. <laughs> it's been, um, been working out for me as well. So um, any questions so far? Um, yes, when you were talking about the uh, four different Slices for information. I missed number three. Oh, yes. I'm sorry about that. Yes. So we That's have okay. um, National Park Service, the Bureau of Land Management, mm -hmm. Fish and Wildlife Service, and the U.S. Forest Service. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So um, I also kind of keep a snack bag um, and a cooler. So I'm still working on what that looks like for me, um, especially if I'm camping, that can be a little bit different. Um, so I'm also not attached to a certain cooler. So if you have recommendations and you're like, this cooler is great for road trips, I am all ears for that <laughs> as well. So keeping snacks on hand as well and making sure that I'm not packing those. Um, I usually keep those in the front seat if I'm not traveling with anybody. And then also just making sure to have your maps on hand or download before you lose service. I've traveled along the West where, you know, the state, pretty much Wyoming is pretty much no self-service, especially, you know, until you get to the towns. So, you know, if you uh, want to stop and um, you don't know if they're self-service or not, I always just kind of err on the side of downloading um, everything beforehand just to make sure you, you don't get lost and you know where you're going. Um, and then if you're camping or glamping, I'm definitely a glamper these days. <laughs> so um, I like to uh, keep all of my camping gear in a big tote. So maybe I'll take one of those plastic totes out and replace it with a bigger one um, for all my camping stuff. 
Um, and I typically separate my sleeping stuff and my kitchen stuff. So good camping practice, you wanna space those out um, a little bit. So I just kind of keep those separate um, um, or, or I just put it in one big tote if, if it's just myself. Um, I also keep a poop kit as well. So that's just kind of like a little shovel, and a toilet paper, and then a bag for the uh, disposal of your toilet paper. Definitely do not burn it. Don't bury it. Um, pack it out, you know, throw it out at the next gas station. I know that's a little weird, but you know, definitely that happens um, while we're out there. So, um, and then also hand sanitizer and small soap as well is kind of part of that poop kit. And then I use the um, jug of water to wash my hands as well. Um, so yeah, um, one thing to consider as well is smoky clothes. If you're having a campfire, I once did a business trip and I accidentally mixed my smoky clothes with my business clothes. So I smelled like campfire the whole time. Um, so that's just something that I've learned uh, to consider is maybe having an extra, you know, maybe bringing an extra cube bag or whatnot and keeping that away from the rest of your clothes if you're gonna go out after, after camping or fishing and whatnot. So um, just kind of some learnings there. And then your post trip, um, I always, I know once we get to our destination, it's really hard to unpack. I don't know if you're one of those folks that like lets your luggage sit there for days, maybe weeks <laughs> until you really want that shirt, then you got to unpack. So I recommend um, at least prioritizing your wet clothes and your wet shoes. So making sure that you take those out and let those air dry um, is really important. Um, and then also cleaning your cooler. <laughs> I've had some really horrible, uh, interesting experiments growing in my coolers before so it's not fun to clean out when you gotta um, get it back out um, and then again I always just take care of the smoky clothes as well immediately right when I get home because then I, I've noticed that the whole house starts to smell um, if I'm too lazy to unpack those things <laughs> so um, that's kind of my my spiel there so any questions or any other additions oh wag bags yes I definitely keep that I, I forgot that yes that's also my poop kit as well just in case a wag bag is really great um, you can it's a it's pretty small um, and then once you open it um, it's kind of like a bigger plastic bag that you poop in <laughs> and uh, there's kind of some materials in there that'll help um, one with odor and then also just kind of com composing composting and it usually comes with like a little bit of toilet paper and a hand wipe um, and then once you're done you'll put it back into the little bag and then it seals so then you can toss it whenever you're done so definitely good on Harriet for the wag bags yes <laughs> any other oh collapsible cooler yes I once saw those um so if you have any brands or whatnot I would love to get that information um wag bags I found them at um um, land management offices. Um, so if you go to like the U.S. forest uh, or um, if you an area that you need to get a permit, um, that's where I found them. You can also buy them at Bass Pro or um, Cabela's um, in, in your camping places as well. So, oh, nice. Bought a giant box online. That's probably a good idea too. So any other questions or any other additions? Awesome. Well, thanks for your time. <laughs> awesome, Erica. Thank you. I, the smoky clothes, I, yeah, that's, that's, and hair, like, cause you have long hair too. So it just, it sticks to you. <laughs> so cool. Awesome. Let's, um, and I love these. And I think that that really, that's a huge point about not having stuff out um, showing. I like that you said that you put it in so that way to hide it as well. I think stickers are another big detour, or not deterrent, but like people are attracted. So if you have a bunch of fly fishing stickers on your car or something, I mean, it's just screaming like, hey, I probably have some, some good gear in my car. So um, I, I have one sticker on my car. I should probably take it off, honestly. I know Eric he doesn't have any stickers on his car because he doesn't want anyone to know, you know, what he might have in his car. So, yeah. Oh, so I just saw one more question that I think is really important. Uh, washing your stuff in between different waters. So, yes, that's really important. So that's also why I keep the water jug as well. Um, and if I'm in a hotel, I'll just kind of do a quick rinse in the shower or the bathtub. Um, and there's some different um, soaps that you can use as well. Um, and the, uh, 
totally forgetting the name right now, but that's also really helpful to definitely rinse off your stuff. Um, I've also noticed that gas stations or campgrounds as well will have a water spigot. So um, they're usually open for you to use those as well. Awesome. And some waterways, I know like on the Green River in Utah, there are some places that will actually first to scrub your boots, you know, so that way you're not transporting any, um, any invasive organisms into that water. So there are some, uh, some rivers or some bodies of water that have that as well. So awesome. Okay. Um, and please Angelica and Erica chime in on any of this as well. Um, I, the one, like really one of the big questions that we get, especially with United on the Fly is like how, like to connection. So I, I'm gonna open up and kind of share the website really fast. Cause I think it's important to show what there is within the website. So how you can connect with the group, but I'm gonna talk about uh, some other DIY planning such as post topics, use, utilizing hashtags, you know, I mean, um, and looking up locations and trying to figure out, you know, where, where can we go from, you know, where can we go and visit, uh, connecting with anglers, internet searches, fly shops, groups, forums, which are, eh, you hit and miss sometimes, and also land acknowledgement. I, I, I really personally feel that that's a, a huge thing to, if you're going somewhere, if you're visiting, whether it's in the States or whether it's international, you know, to really look and see what the history is of, of where you're going and acknowledging, you know, what, where you're at. Um, so the first thing is going to be this connection. I'm going, so you can click and go through, you can connect with groups. Um, it's just another kind of resource. Um, you can connect with industry women um, also, or connect with a women guide as well. Um, and here, I guess here's just a screenshot of it. So you can go into that area. Also, there's international um, groups. Now do know that anybody that's listed themselves on the website um, are the only ones that are listed because we want to get permission. So yes, there are other women's groups out there, but um, we want to make sure that um, they've given us permission. Um, and one of the other things too, kind of within our admin uh, retreat is to, kind of talk to each group and just make sure that they are also aligned with some of our same kind of goals as well as far as our Jedi work. And that will definitely be um, coming in the future with, with everybody listed. But um, if you want to find a woman's guy, a woman guide, you could uh, just go into the area and they're listed here. And again, these are licensed and insured women, um, women guides. And so I do check. So people that try to put themselves on the website, I do actually um, look them up and make sure that that uh, they're official. Um, and each year I go back because some people don't renew their licenses. So um, that is something that we do just to make sure that we're, you know, giving everybody the, the best and most current information. Um, and then women in the industry. So let's say you're on a road trip and you wanted to connect with other women that are, are in the fly fishing industry. So you can kind of plan out your route and uh, or connect with other with other women as well. Um, one of the things too within our closed Facebook group is that we actually add post topics. So let's say that you are trying to plan a trip to Florida or to Alaska or Minnesota or wherever it might be. You can actually go to where these pinned uh, post topics are and you can see what previous posts have been about, you know, for Florida. Because a lot of people ask the same questions like, hey, I'm going to be going to Florida. Does anybody have a guide recommendation? Or, you know, where would you go in the Miami area? Or I want a DIY for peacock bass or whatever it might be. Um, so it's just another resource for you to just look through all the pinned stuff. Um, you can also use a search function within the group and um, look for you know, Yellowstone and Grand Tetons and, and uh, Glacier National Park, those tend to be kind of the, the more asked about areas. So you can just research that and see what other people have posted. Um, and follow hashtags. So, you know, there's people use, you know, we use hashtags and I, hashtags and I follow hashtags all the time. So um, fly fish Yellowstone or, you know, Montana or fly fish Montana, fish Washington or whatever it might be. Um, if you follow hashtags, you can also look up locations. So, um, you know, I, I know that there is some controversy with, with geotagging, but a lot of the big rivers, you know, um, 
especially like if I know that they can host or, or hold a lot of people, I might, I'm going to put that I was on the green river in Utah, you know, um, or, or whatever. So you can look at different locations as well. Um, so it's just another great way to research uh, where to go and connect with anglers. So this is where you kind of have to put yourself out there and make friends, right? There's so many amazing friends all over the world and you can follow different hashtags like brown folks fishing. You can follow um, women who fly fish. I mean, there's all these other just, just different hashtags and you can just start going through it and, and making you know real true uh, genuine connections. And you'd be amazed at the people that you meet. Like I've met Erica, you know, online. I've met Angelica. I met Clary. Like, you know, I've met so many great humans um, online. So um, maybe step out of your comfort zone a little bit and just send a DM or just start liking and commenting and just building a relationship. And you'll be pretty amazed at, at the really incredible um, individuals that you meet. Um, and internet, internet DIY searches. So this is a big one. Like I just put in, I just screenshot this, this today, fly fishing Northeast, Northeastern Washington. So let's say that you want to come to Northeastern Washington. So I just, I literally put in, where do I fish in Northeastern Washington? So this is what I came up with. You know, I get almost 10,000 results and all of a sudden I find this and it's like, oh my gosh, there's Bailey Lake, Big Sheep Creek. I didn't even know about all these, you know? So there's so much information out there as well um, that, you know, you just have to put in a little work um, in order to do it, but you can find um, some incredible stuff that's already listed out there. And a fly shop lookup. So this is Silverbow Fly Shop. This is here in Spokane, but most fly shops are gonna give great fishing reports um, and so you can kind of look at that and, and, you know, they might have hatch charts or something so you can kind of figure out, okay, when's the season, what kind of bugs am I want to go fish for, when's the best time to go to Yellowstone, you know, when is it not snowing, or when are, when is it open, so just doing a lot of those kind of research, um, research um, stuff online with that. And then women's groups, so like this is Spokane Women on the Fly, we have we have 751 members, but that's definitely not just in the Spokane area because there's just women that are coming kind of in our area and are like, hey, I would love to fish. Does anybody want to fish or meet up? So it's another great resource just to connect and again, just make those uh, just genuine connections. And fishing forums. Um, I'm not a huge fan of fly fishing forums, um, but there are, you know, they are out there. Um, I. I like to personally like to choose other ways to um, get my information or connect with people, but there is a lot of great information in some of these fly fishing forums. Um, and find the season. So let's say that you like, for instance, I run these races. That's what I love to do on other than fishing. And I'm going to Norway next year. So there's a running race in Norway. Well, I know that I've heard that there's grayling and brown trout, but I had no idea that like Norway is one of the best places to fly fish. So now I'm thinking, okay, I got to do some DIY stuff. And so I just started researching. So I'm finding out now when are the seasons. So I'll be there in August of 22. So I'm looking here and I found this great thing and it says best time is in August. So I'm looking at, you know, if you're going to be planning a trip in a certain like in June or July or August, you can even just use a search and just be where, you know, when, what can I fish for in July in Yellowstone National Park or whatever it might be. So just kind of finding the rivers that are going to fish best um, for you um, that way. And this is a huge one is um, I always, this is like kind of the number one question really with a lot of these classes is starting to look at hatch charts. So maybe you don't even know what a hatch chart is. Well, you can research, um, Orvis has a phenomenal just educational program and they have a Eastern United States hatch chart and they also have a Western United States hatch chart. And um, so you can kind of see, okay, well, when are the certain bugs hatching? So let's say that you might want to go and chase salmon flies, for instance. Well, in Western, the West, they kind of start in, the, in Washington kind of about now, almost in May. 
and then they're going to go all the way through to Yellowstone to almost August. So you can kind of chase stone or sand flies all the way from Washington to Montana um, through August. So just learning and looking up and, and understanding how hatch charts work and kind of seeing, okay, well, spotted caddis here are going to be May, June, July, and August. So just if you want to search or if you want to fish a certain hatch, then just knowing that those are the times that you would need to go to whatever location you're looking at. Um, and another thing too is looking at Missoula, like if you're going to go fish Missoula, for instance, to go to uh, just look up Missoula, Missoula fishing reports per se, or wherever you're going to be. Um, and then let's, and if you click on a river, well, if you then click on a river and it'll give you a report. And it usually will say, it says squalas to have our rogue stones, water walkers, millers, high vis, skinny chubbies, and true squala stones. Well, I don't know what a rogue stone looks like, right? Let's say, because um, most of us, most flies are just like an artistic expression of um, whatever the artist wants or the fly designer is going to name them. And so what I tend to do is I'll say, okay, well, the rogue stones. So then I go and do an internet search. I put, put in rogue stone flies, click on images, and then I see, okay, this is what a rogue stone fly looks like. So then I'll open up my fly boxes and, and start looking and be, say, oh, I have something that looks similar to this. I don't need to buy anything. Or maybe I need to go um, to a fly shop and buy something or, or buy something online or, or whatever. Um, so it's just a great way to kind of familiarize yourself with uh, what, this, what the flies look like. Because um, honestly, I don't, I, I probably only know like 15 names total of what my what bugs I have in my boxes. I could say, hey, it's a stonefly, it's a caddis, it's a mayfly, but just being able to research that is, um, is really easy to do. Um, the other thing too is understanding flow charts. Um, this is a big thing too, just for safety as well. Um, if you go to waterweather.gov, and, and again, we'll put all of the links um, like with what Erica was, all of the BLM, all of the links that she was talking about and all of these as well, we'll put them in on the Facebook group, but understand what a, what a flow chart is. So um, this is great because it also gives predictions. So let's say that you're gonna go from a week from now, I'm looking at this and it looks like it's on the drop. So that's good, but still it's, it's kind of on flood stage and that's, you know, you're not gonna wanna plan your trip um, based on a May when I know that in the Coeur d'Alene River in North Idaho is gonna be runoff and it can be really dangerous. So this is just really good just for safety for you, but also to know when the best time to fish is. Um, the other thing too is to research ocean tides. So this is, if you're gonna be fishing any type of estuaries, any ocean, any flats, or anything that um, has to deal with tides, then it's really good for, um, or it's very important for you as an angler to understand the tides, um, to kind of know when, when to fish, but also when you might get stranded. So again, this is another safety issue too, is, is knowing, you know, are there certain points at high tide or at low tide that you can only be at, but you really have to watch the time because you don't want to get stuck. So that's just an important, um, and I use NOAA um, uh, to look up a lot of the tides, but you can just go online, any internet um, you know, company or internet provider that you want to use your searching, you can do that. So, um, and then indigenous land acknowledgement as um, like with Erica, she already put this link in and, it, and it's, um, there's a great app actually out there um, that you can go to and I have a picture of the app, but you can download it and you can, it'll show your location and it shows where you're at. So it's great because then you can then further research to see, um, you know, what, what, what land or whose land are you on? Um, for instance, for uh, Alaska, I go to, I was born in Alaska and I go to Alaska quite often. So this is huge for me is if I'm going to go into Quinnahawk, uh, Alaska, which I will be there in June, you know, I want to know about the Yupik tribe, right? Like I want to learn about them and I want to, um, to just kind of immerse myself as much as I can. And so these are um, two young kids that I met and just um, as I was going in and it's, it's cool just to learn even just about um, 
just their the native language and knowing you know what does it mean like it's just it's good to just for me I want to learn as much as I can and truly immerse myself into it and acknowledge that I'm on their land and I'm privileged to be even be there to, to and to be able to fish um and this was you know this is again the nativegov.org so um, why is it important or why is Indigenous land acknowledgement important? So I'm just going to quickly read this. Um, it's important to understand the long-standing history that has brought you to reside on the land and to seek to understand your place within that history. Land acknowledgement do not exist in a past tense or historical context. Colonial, colonialism is a current ongoing process and we need to build our mindfulness of our present participation. So it's, it's huge. It's, it's something that just we as, as individuals um, to acknowledge where we're at. Um, this is that the native land um, ca so this is on my phone uh, so this is what the app looks like and it'll actually pinpoint exactly where you're at so you can see where where you're at it's really a great app um cool do we have any questions right now and do you angelica and erica do you guys have anything to add that you'd like to add that i um, missed kind of with all of those that information Yes, uh, a, a couple of people have asked me on my personal DMs about yeah. uh, the packing cubes in terms of like um, how I, what I put in them. So I actually divide them by climate and I also divide them on like a daily. So I'll put, um, if I know it's going to be chilly when I first get there, I'll put like two or three outfits combined in one cube and then I'll just do it on the daily. Um, based on the weather. I like that. And I, I really liked what Erica said to, uh, to um, keep your fishing clothes or the clothes that you're gonna change into on top. I think that that's huge too is, um, yeah, to make sure that it's accessible. So you're not trying to dig through all of your packing cubes, you know, to, to get the clothes that you want to wear. Yeah. So, um, cool. Anything else, Erica, that you had to add to anything so far? Uh, no, thank you. Yeah, that was great. Awesome. All right. Um, and I know that there's some other chat stuff, and I'll go through that. Um, uh, one, one is, so explain hashtag versus the ad sign. That's a great question. So um, you can actually follow hashtags. Um, so, and this is mostly for Instagram. And those that probably see me personally, I don't, the only reason I'm on Facebook, honestly, is because of the United Women of Fly closed group. If I didn't have that, I wouldn't be on Facebook. But um, so on Instagram, you can follow hashtags. So a hashtag is kind of like a search, a searching, a search engine. So um, let's say hashtag fly fishing. So you can basically search and find every photo that has been tagged. It's like a filing cabinet, like the Dewey Decimal System, right? So it's, um, and probably some don't even know what the Dewey, Dewey Decimal System is, but <laughs> um, it's just basically, yeah, just like a, um, a way to organize pictures and to tag them. Um, the at sign is going to be like, if you do uh, an at, so that would be like you're tagging a person, an organization, or like a profile, um, like an account. Um, and so that would be where it's just tagging them per se. Um, but the hashtag is actually like marking it and tagging it. So that way somebody can find it more easily. So um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, okay, so some travel tips. So um, I just got back from Costa Rica and I'm actually quite cheap as well. So I have a few inexpensive travel tips um, because I want to, I just want to see everything and do everything, but I also have a, a budget and um, I, you know, have to work to pay for everything too. So how can we do that? Um, one of the biggest things is to know, like if you're going to buy a plane ticket, there's actually a certain time to buy your plane ticket. So, and this is all online, you can research this, but really the prime booking window for buying a plane ticket is about three weeks to four months. So I know for me, I'm very like, 
I know already, like I already know I'm going to Norway in August of 2022. So I'm already gonna start like saving all my miles and try to make it as inexpensive as possible. But, um, and I wanna buy my ticket a year in advance cause I'm a planner, but truly to get the best booking price, if you go three weeks to four months, that's gonna be your best plane ticket price. Now there's also better days to buy your plane ticket. So buying your days on a Sunday is better than buying your plane ticket on a Monday. So prices go up. So you actually can save between three to 15% on flights um, that if you buy them on a Sunday. Um, and then cheap flight calendar, also think about like buying, so here's, and this is again, it's all online, but like, buying stuff, but also when to fly. So a lot of people will try to fly out on a Friday and fly home on a Sunday, because that's obviously better within our schedules. But if you can be a little bit more lenient on when you can fly in or out, your, your flights actually might be less expensive. Um, and then internet or domestic. So book on Sundays, not on Mondays. Depart on Fridays, not on Mondays. You know, so there's different things that you can do in order to actually save money when buying a, a, a plane ticket and use air miles. So I, um, I have a credit card and I, I, try, I always pay it off each month. Now, not everybody is as disciplined with that, you know, but I only try, I always try to buy stuff um, on my credit card that I can pay off. But like I put my, uh, electricity. I put everything that I can, my groceries, everything on my credit card because I want air miles because I want to be able to fly for free. So that's one way that I, um, one travel tip and one way that I save money. Um, also, I have found um, in all of my research that if you go to Southwest to rent a car, it's the cheapest place to rent a car. So I don't go there for, I really, I don't even know if Southwest flies out of Spokane. They used to, but I don't know if they still do. Um, but for car rentals, Southwest, from what I have found, is the cheapest. So just another thing, you just go to southwestairlines.com and click on cars, and it's a, um, it's a great way to rent a car. I've also heard that Costco is a good place, but I don't have a Costco card because that costs money. And if I'm trying to save money, I don't want to spend money to get discounts. So I, uh, Southwest works, uh, works great for me. And then I use Priceline and also hotels.com if I'm gonna stay at a hotel. Um, Priceline's great because you can name your own price. And um, this is where you have to be a little, I mean, you obviously don't, you can't be as specific as far as the location that you wanna be like right in this, you know, the hotel or two beds. So if you're a little more like open to other things, um, then you can get a better price. Um, and recreation. So recreation.gov, you know, and um, with, with COVID, a lot of the campgrounds have definitely become more popular and are becoming more booked. So um, definitely kind of planning ahead um, and looking to see where you might want to camp and trying to reserve campsites. Um, but there's also a ton of primitive campsites out there as well. Um, and with all the resources that Erica gave us, we can, you can kind of look, but you can also go onto Google Earth, and do some research that way and kind of see if there are some primitive, primitive camping, but also know if it's public and or if it's private. So that's again, just some of those research things that you have to do um, just to do the work to, um, to make sure that you're in a location that you're allowed to be in. Um, and then some air travel tips. <laughs> Compression socks. These are, this is Clary's. <laughs> this is like total Pacific Northwest, even though she lives in Wyoming. I know she's not a PNW girl, but um, I, like I said, I wear compressions. Maybe I'm getting old. I don't know. But when I go from like a dry climate, such as the Pacific Northwest, and I go to somewhere that's um, much more humid, I just, I, I have to wear compression socks. So um, I, they're a must in my book. Um, and then attaching a rod tube to a carry-on. So um, you're allowed two carry-ons in most planes. Now this is something you'll have to um, look at for your flights, but um, you wanna attach, if you attach your fly rod or your tubes to your backpack, it's one piece of luggage, it's one carry-on. So make sure you have some straps, duct tape, whatever it might be, so you can attach it to your backpack. 
Um, because again, if you're carrying it separately, they'll consider that two pieces. And if you have a purse also, then that would be three pieces and you have to check something. So um, just knowing some of those rules and regulations with whatever airlines that you're on. And also it's huge to know like what is the, what are the dimensions for your carry-on? So actually look this up and some of them actually have a weight as well. And for some of the smaller planes, they'll weigh you and they weigh your bag. They, you know, cause obviously for safety, they um, need to make sure that they have all the weight is dispersed properly. Um, so, and then you wanna measure that bag. Cause I know I've flown on some smaller planes and I had this really big backpack that would not fit under the seat and I couldn't take it on. So I had to check it. Um, the other thing too is, um, so if you're, especially in Alaska, cause I travel to Alaska quite often, but knowing that um, you can only have one lug one piece of luggage and one carry on. Um, if you had two, two pieces of luggage, a lot of times they prioritize it based on weight. And especially when people are coming back and they have fish boxes, those fish boxes get prioritization to get flown into from a small town into Anchorage. And so if you have two pieces of luggage, a lot of times only one piece of your luggage is gonna make it, the other one's gonna get stuck. So these are all things for you to really consider um, as far as when you're traveling. Uh, and a waterproof backpack is- um, Can I add something to that, Heather? Yes, yeah, please. Um, so I went to Mexico recently and took my rod and from the US mm -hmm. to Mexico, I was able to carry my rod on, but from uh, Mexico to the US, it was a must check in. Uh, so I had to check in. So I went through security and then I got stuck and I had to go all the way back to check it in. So that's a Mexico policy. So mm -hmm. just kind of looking at your routes, um, you know, in both destinations, both ways round trip, making sure that you're, you're able to carry it on or if you have to check it in. Absolutely. And that's why I loved how you break it down with like your planning, because that's kind of a part of your whole planning process, too, is is looking to see like what are the regulations for your flights or for COVID, especially nowadays, you know, it's like because each state is different. So that's something it's our responsibility to um, to look at and know all of that. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, and a waterproof backpack. So um, it's great as a boat bag and it can also be a carry-on. So um, yes, waterproof backpacks can be more expensive. The roll tops are less expensive than zippers. So, you know, if you, um, if you are able to purchase a waterproof backpack, it's kind of a multi-purpose thing. And it's, um, especially for me living in the Pacific Northwest, it rains. So um, I definitely uh, will work an extra nursing shift so I can pay for a, a waterproof backpack because that's important where I live. Um, and then travel cases. So there's different companies that offer different um, travel cases. Um, you know, and something to think about is how long of fly rods are you bringing? So I do a lot of spay fishing and um, those are really long fly rods, like 13 and a half feet. So like a standard uh, little case here wouldn't work for me. So this is actually a spay, this is a fish pond makes like a spay rod case um, that can actually hold my longer, bigger rods. Um, so just knowing, and again, some of the normal sized, um, or the like uh, other um, carrying cases, they are only for like nine to nine and a half feet rods. So if you have Euro rods or a 10 foot fly rod, it won't fit in some of these. So again, that's part of the planning process, just looking to see, um, to see what you're gonna have. And for me personally, I like to have straps so I can wear it as a backpack. I like it to be cushioned. Um, and this is great. This is the Orvis. Orvis makes a great one as well. All the companies make great stuff. And you can see too, I love this because it shows like you put so much other stuff into it, right? Like, um, as I mentioned, kind of when we were getting started is I take some of my heavy electronics and I put them in a bag and this is where they go because this bag is smaller so I can make it make it more heavy. Um, all your reels, all of my fishing gear. And I tend to check my stuff. I used to be so afraid that it would get stolen or, you know, I don't know. Um, now I just don't want to hassle with it. So I check it. Um, so, and I've never had any issues. I do use the TSA uh, locks that are combinations. Um, so just to detour if somebody was, because it'd probably be pretty easy to just take a fly reel. But um, I just, 
I check it and I haven't had any issues. So, and then Fishy did a collaboration with Orvis. So it's kind of a fun little fashion thing too. Um, if you want kind of a, um, a fun print. Um, and, you know, just as talking about like flying back from Mexico, also knowing your COVID, your travel guidelines, right? So there's different guidelines with every state and every country that you're in and you, it's your responsibility to know all of that information. Do you need a COVID test? Do you need, you know, can you be immunized? You know, what are all the regulations for that? And carry small bills. So when, especially if you're traveling internationally, um, a lot of times you might be using a taxi. Uh, so having, I carry about $30 of ones and then I carry probably 10 to $25 bills. And then I might carry a couple twenties, but I always carry more small bills just because if I'm gonna be taxiing or doing something, I have the proper amount of, of cash. Or if I'm sharing a taxi with somebody, then you know when everybody has twenties, it's kind of a pain. It's nice if you're actually prepared for that. And it's huge too for knowing, so Google Translate and also having a currency uh, app um, because, you know, especially if you're traveling somewhere else, um, just out of respect, um, we should try to speak the language, even if I'm super bad at it, I want to, you know, be respectful and, and try. Um, and so having Google Translate and you can download um, an offline language and so that way you can be on airplane mode and still have it work. Um, so it's really important to um, just, you know, kind of not be the obnoxious American, but try. And I'm saying this because I just got back from Costa Rica and I was with some obnoxious Americans. So, um, no, yeah, just try just looking at it and knowing the currency, too. So you can download a currency app for free and um, it'll show any. So it'll just um, be able to convert to whatever that country's uh, currency is. Always have a rain jacket. Always. You never know. You um, and actually, uh, you can act and you can get hypothermia in the in the summer. So having a rain jacket is is really really important. Um, the other thing too is um, having some sort of insect repellent. So kind of wherever you go, um, you can treat your own garments. Um, there are garments that you can buy that actually are um, impregnated with permethrin or with a a bug stopper. But you can do this all on your own as well. Um, I would say just to look at all of the instructions and make sure that you do it properly. Um, and then there's, like I said, there's bug stopper clothing. A lot of this clothing, it's um, impregnated with permethrin and permethrin is a derivative of the chrysanthemum. Say that two times too fast. Um, so it's a natural product and a lot of this clothing or if you do it yourself, um, it'll last for about 70 washes. So it's just good for wherever you're at to um, have bug stopper stuff. And this is why, because these are my legs currently right now <laughs> because of, of bugs. So um, making sure too, when you're traveling to have like a Benadryl cream, maybe having an antihistamine on you as well as some cortisone, right? And these are all things you can buy at Walmart, very inexpensive, but it's important to, oh, and I have this ice skin soothing gel. Like that's what I'm putting on my legs right now. Um, I actually, you can't even see my ankles because my legs are so swollen right now. Um, but so it's, this is important stuff. It's traveling, whether you're in the United States and or, you know, anywhere internationally as well. Cotton balls and Vaseline. So um, this is just a great fire starter. So one cotton ball that is saturated with Vaseline can hold a flame for about five minutes. So um, if you have a lighter cool, this is a metal match that you can use, or you can use two rocks to get a spark, but it's just a way um, just to prevent hypothermia, to get warm, to get clean water, boil your water, whatever it might be. And it's cheap. It's great stocking stuffers, um, a great way to just, you know, um, provide your friends with a life-saving tool. <laughs> Um, and then just like I mentioned, you can get hypothermia in the summer. So this is really something to think about. You know, if you fall in the water, if the water's cold, um, if you're sweating a lot, there's just a lot of, you can, you can get this. So just stay hydrated, try to stay dry, bring layers and always be prepared. Um, this is not an inexpensive tool, but I do, um, I use this, it's a Garmin inReach. Um, 
REI sells them and when they have, and actually in May, the end of May, I think they're gonna have their sale. So a lot of times they have a discount on this. Um, you pay for a service or you can pay for a service if you were anywhere that doesn't have, that has satellite, but you don't have cell coverage, you can actually send a text message out. Um, but if you don't buy the service, you can still press SOS. So wherever you are, um, if you turn it on, even if you don't pay for the service, you can still call somebody to come to you. Um, so it's a one, uh, Spokane went on the fly our first year, we had a woman that was up in North Idaho, very remote area. She was walking down a path, a very easy, well-worn path. She fell, she tripped over a rock, fell, and she broke her neck. So somebody had to hold C-spine for four hours. A helicopter had to come in. We had to flag people down. So if I would have had the GPS, a lot, the process would have been a lot soon, faster. So that's actually why I purchased it because of that situation. So um, again, I'm just trying, you know, thinking about safety for sure. Um, and then the other just kind of final thing is enjoy this journey, like wherever you go, whether it's your, you know, just down the street to whatever river or wherever you're planning on traveling, um, you know, just always enjoy where you're at. Just look at it and, and look around and just realize how lucky we are and how blessed that we can actually be here and fish and fish these uh, amazing places that we get to go to. Um, cool. Well, you guys, thank you so much for uh, first and foremost. Thank you, Angelica. Thank you, Erica. Thank you for your time. I know it went over and I really uh, appreciate both you guys for um, just your organizational knowledge, your information, like it's so valuable. And um, I definitely learned a lot and we'll be posting um, both Angelica and Erica's all of their information um, throughout May. So this will not be the last that you see and or hear of it. And we'll also um, be posting this on YouTube as well. So you can go back and refer back to it um, as well as we'll put all the links that everybody talked about or that were posted into the chat um, into the Facebook group. And I'll also make sure it's in the description on the YouTube. So that way you can look at stuff also. Um, and it's really, you know, just like with everything in life, it's about doing the work. So you just have to, you know, do the work as far as um, researching and looking up and, um, you know, just, yeah, looking to see what you can fly, what you can't, what the dimensions are, what the tides are, all of that. It, you know, there is definitely some effort, but you can, once you put in a little work, you definitely um, can uh, make a trip very inexpensive um, and, and fun. And the more prepared and planned and organized you are, the, the better it's going to be. So um, thank you again to Angelica and Erica. You guys, I like can't say thank you enough. And um, thank you to everybody who joined. And yeah, you'll hear more from us. And thank you so much for this beautiful, sunny uh, evening that you spent with us. I really appreciate it.